talking about uh, systematic theology. But we really want these to kind of serve as, um, I guess, a bit of, um, you know, sometimes you have back issues. I don't really have many back issues because I'm a healthy specimen. But some of you might have, <laughs> some people might have uh, back issues. And when you do, sometimes you need someone to come up alongside and kind of correct your, correct your posture, correct your spine, kind of do a few crunches, you know? And, um, and so that's probably, I'm just making that up. But sometimes you need you need somebody to uh, kind of correct the spine um, of of your thinking as it relates to uh, the Bible, as it relates to theology. And so this year is all about kind of doing some spine adjustments and just kind of like oh okay some correction maybe to our spiritual posture and our understanding. So that's the goal of over the course of this year theology cafe. So. Hope you're up for the journey, it's going to be great, it's going to be interesting. And tonight I'm going to just, uh, I guess, bring in Ed as, as quick as possible. And um, he's going to, I guess, introduce the whole subject of spiritual gifts. But then after Ed, we're going to, then have, going to have some small group conversation for a few minutes. And then I'll come back up and throw some questions to Ed. And then after that, if you have any questions, I uh, would love for you to even have some opportunity to ask some questions in this format as well. And so as Ed is uh, teaching, feel free to write down some questions uh, as, as the night goes on. So Ed has been part of our church for a while now. How, how long, Ed? A few Two weeks. weeks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> a few years. Before lockdown, way back before yeah, lockdown. Yeah, before lockdown. So Ed has been a pastor in Sunderland as well. Uh, and so he has that kind of experience as well. So let's welcome Ed. It's kind of a strange thing. But let's welcome Ed into uh, tonight's lesson. Thank you, Johnny. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Excellent. Uh, I feel like I should be having a guitar and singing <laughs> here from here. You, a lot of us know a lot about spiritual gifts or think you do and I'm one of those people who thinks they know a lot but the more and more I study the more and more I realize the less I know if that makes sense so our purpose is to help you discover your spiritual gift we're going to talk about things you've got to feel free to question and answer after um, each session um, we're going to have four weeks of relatively short sessions to get through a lot of uh, material so we can't cover everything in intricate detail. What I would suggest you do is look, there's a taste of video we called Introduction to Spiritual Gifts or something. It's under the equip um, part of the City Church, City Life, Church, City Life website. Um, you've got a questionnaire coming at the end. It's long. It will help you to um, identify your own spiritual gift, but can I just caution you a little bit, a little word of warning. It's not the be all and end all, right? Um, so don't go, oh, this says I'm the next prophet that's going to do this and what else, and I'm going to go and preach to the nations. Don't do that. It's a good guide. It's a good starting point that you can talk to other people about. There's also a little um, thing I did to help you with some questions as well. Um, I'll try to cover all the gifts in four weeks. We're going to do some background each week and also something about the actual gifts themselves. We want to focus the information that we're giving you to help you use your gift well and as well as uh, look at our first selection of gifts. So I'm just going to say a word of prayer uh, if we could just take a moment. Father, we thank you so much that you give us all the tools, all the equipment that we need to serve the world, to bring your gospel to the world, to be your church in the world, to help us, Lord, to uh, minister to the poor. Lord God, we pray tonight that as we look at your word and look at the information that we've got from your word, that we would be encouraged and helped to understand the place you have for us in the church, the place you have for us, the work that you have for us to do. And I pray for your blessing on each one of us as we try and discover together what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. So Johnny's working the slide thing, so um, let's hope that all works. We're going to have the first slide up now where we've got a, a brief overview of spiritual gifts and I put persons because there is a, a kind of a, it's not that distinctive in, in the Bible. 
Uh, sometimes he's talking about people, sometimes he's talking about uh, actual gifts themselves. So we need the next click, and then we should see some things flying, very fancy. Um, so this is just basically a list of why you'll find the spiritual gifts in the Bible. And almost all our information about spiritual gifts comes from two places, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 and um, chapter 12 to 14. Uh, that's where you'll get the majority of the information that we have. You'll notice a couple of things on there. Um, yeah, I'm just checking that it hasn't twisted them around too much. You'll see marriage and celibacy on there. I'm not going to talk a lot about those two gifts. All right. Um, I will mention them a little tiny bit tonight. But if you've got questions about that, you can you can ask. So let's go on and look at 1 Corinthians 12. That's the first thing we're going to do. So if we go to the next slide. So let's read together. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, it's the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one, just as He determines. Now, when Paul is writing his first letter to the Corinthians, we have to understand one thing. He's dealing with a problem, right? And this list is ad hoc. He's not formulating a nice, neat, neat list for us. These are basically off the top of his head of things he's thinking about. So it's not the definitive list, list of spiritual gifts, but it's a, a good place to start. And when he's writing to them, there's all lots of status sitting going on. In Corinth, there's a problem because they have this thing called rhetoric. They're sort of superstars of the day, are these speakers who go and they, they do all this rhetoric and fancy speaking. And um, in Corinth, I love that kind of stuff. And when he writes um, to them, he's trying to deal with that because they've got a particular problem in that they're elevating certain people above certain others. And if you get anything from today, get that. We all have the same spirit. And I, I don't mean some have different amounts. I mean, we all have the same spirit, but it's God who determines who has what gift and how to use it. So if you understand anything, understand that. Now, you probably think you've understood what I've just said. I've taken lots of years to understand this fully. You haven't got more, let me be clear about this. Johnny hasn't got more of the spirit than you do. And I don't have more than you do. We all have the same amount, but God apportions the gifts in order to get his church doing the right thing and working as a unit. That's why there are diversities of gifts. When he's writing this letter, he's also, um, he writes a letter from Corinth to Romans in which he talks a little bit about the same thing. And what that shows us is that the spiritual gifts are not dependent on the presence of Paul, top or eight, because he's never been to Rome at this point. He's never got there. He writes to them from Corinth, but he's never planted a church in Rome or done any of that kind of thing. So here's a definition of a spiritual gift, if you put the next slide up. A spiritual gift is any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in the ministry of the church. So any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in the ministry of the church. It's important that we understand that. We're not just talking about the, the funky ones that we like to see on a single morning. You know, we're not talking just about prophecy and miracles and those kind of things. Um, any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. If your gift is making a the coffee, then make the coffee the best that you can. Then make the coffee, make the coffee. Your coffee should be, at the, at the very least, 
better than a secular equivalent if you're being driven by God. Let's just throw that out there as a challenge. Um, spiritual, not that I'm saying anything about the coffee. <laughs> spiritual gifts are given to equip the church. We have the next one. Spiritual gifts are given to equip the church to carry out its ministry until the return of Christ. Okay, that's how long they last. There won't be any after that. There's no need. And they certainly haven't died out yet. Now, I'm not going to get into that argument in these sessions unless I get asked the question. Um, spiritual gifts, we'll have the next slide. Now, this might surprise you. Spiritual gifts are miraculous and non-miraculous. This is the point that Paul is making. You don't have more of the Spirit because you're prophesying than the person who's cleaning the toilets. Okay? There are status seekers in the church at Corinth and they reject those with what they call inferior gifts. This is why he's writing to them. They've got these people who, who think they have inferior gifts and, and Paul's rebuking those superior people and he turns the entire logic of their status claims upside down and we'll see a bit more about that next week. We've got a tendency to see gifts as either supernatural or natural. I'll just hang on there. We see them as supernatural or natural. I'm saying hang on because we do. In this room, that's how we see them. And so we elevate the more miraculous gifts in importance in our minds. And we devalue the non-miraculous gifts. We also put the people operating in those gifts on pedestals in the more miraculous gifts. Now we do. That's why we have certain people who we look to on the telly to give us our information. Um, and it's the very thing Paul is exhorting the Corinthians not to do. Don't think that the person who, who is preaching or prophesying has more of the Spirit than the person who is greeting the people at the door. The Bible makes no distinction. And we've got to be very careful because we might fail to see God's hand in the working of all the gifts. We might fail to thank God for the person who made the coffee this morning or who cleaned the church this week as they were using their spiritual gifts in that area. Without some of the non-miraculous gifts, which I'll show you later, the church would completely fail to function. Now, for the worldwide church, next slide, please, Johnny. For, it's a bit like when they're doing the COVID announcements, isn't it? Next slide, please. And then all the for the worldwide church to exist as a force for good in the world, and if the local church is truly to reach the people of Sunderland, then all the people using all the gifts are needed. Imagine a church having all the gifts and all the people using all the gifts, it would be something to behold. Now, all Christians have at least one spiritual gift, but for different reasons, not all Christians use their spiritual gifts. On the converse side, some claim they have this or that spiritual gift when they don't. I've seen that a lot. So they promote themselves as being, I'm powerful and important, I've got this gift of prophecy and I'm Hearing it, thinking that you haven't. You've got something else that looks like it, but it's not that. Some people compare themselves with others, and they think, I'm too inferior to have a spiritual gift. Shucks, I can't have a spiritual gift. That's equally a problem, because um, they're not too inferior at all. And next week you'll find out how Paul deals with that problem. Now, no one person has all the necessary gifts for the church to function. Now, think about that. No, if somebody comes along and says, oh, I've got all these gifts, they haven't. Um, and for the church to function properly, they might think it, right, but you can use your gift of encouragement to tell them otherwise. God has arranged it so that we all need to depend on each other. And no one can say, we don't need you. That's what the Bible says. You can't, we're a body made up of different parts. We look at more of that next week. There's no situation where one gift is only invested in one person in the church. You understand what I mean by that? So there's not a situation where one person has the gift of prophecy and that's the only person in the church in the whole world to have the gift of prophecy. Right? That doesn't happen either. Um, now, if we have the next slide, please, Johnny. There are 
different kinds of gifts services and workings now this is important because when it talks about spiritual gifts it doesn't just talk about spiritual gifts he's kind of lassoing it all he's, he's talking about spiritual things there are different kinds of gifts service and workings but it is the same holy spirit who activates them in different believers as i've already said and this is something we really need to get hold of now the next slide please, so here's a structural display of a literal translation of a part of Corinthians now look what it says um, there are diversities of gifts now this is Yoda from Star Wars because it's literal this is literally what it sounds like if diversity of gifts there are but the same spirit diversities of ministries there are but the same Lord diversities of activities there are but the same God who works all things in all people. To each, each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we're all given the manifestation of the Spirit, but it's for the common good. It's not for you. It's for all the rest of us. Now, there's no rank in this. There aren't any rankings in spiritual gifts in terms of the amount of the Spirit you have. Now, I just want to refresh what I just said there. Paul does put what looks like a ranking on certain things. We've got people mixed up with various gifts and so on. And that's fair enough. But what I'm talking about here is the amount of Holy Spirit you have. The amount of Holy Spirit you have isn't determined by your gift. We all have the same spirit. So if we could have the next slide, please. So different gifts don't imply any ranking. That's the important thing in terms of how much Holy Spirit you have. Now let's look at this Romans 12 passage here. And this is something I would like you to get more than anything else, almost more than what I said earlier. It says, for just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. And this is a hard thing for me to take because it means I belong to you and you belong to me. And sometimes I think we're not sure if we want each other. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have to remember that, that you belong to me and I belong to you. And that's how the body's meant to work. <clears throat> we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. All right. We have different gifts. Now, I'm going to give you a little mantra to help you. If you're operating in your spiritual gift, I just threw this one in there. If I could have the next slide, please don't. Say to yourself, whence and whither? Quietly, not out loud. Whence and whither? Whence does the gift come from? And whither does it go to? Right? So every time you're using a spiritual gift, you get yourself out of the equation. Now, I've tried to tell people this for years. How it's sort of like when you put a basketball through the hoop and it doesn't touch the sides. That's kind of how the gift has to work. It has to go through the hoop if you're the hoop and it hasn't got to touch you. That's a really difficult thing to get hold of. But the more you get out of the way, the better it is. Gifts are about the giver and the for ministry to others and they're not about the person with the gift and this is a huge problem in the church because quite often we see people elevated and this is a problem that Paul is trying to deal with so ask whence does it come from and whither does it go the gift has to come from God we can do things of our own volition and they're not coming from God and it's got to be used for the glorification of God and there's too many situations in the church where folks are either attributing spiritual things to God when they aren't from God. I'm just talking from experience as a pastor. I'm not a pastor of this church, so I can say this, right? They're attributing spiritual things to God when they aren't from God. I could give you an example of that later on, maybe, if you ask. But Or they're from another supernatural source. So they're not from God. Or it's from their own mind. Um... And we have to work that out together and it's a tricky one and we just have to trust one another it's very hard to tell people i don't think that's from god 
Um, or they, they bypass the church and they start to bring attention to themselves instead of to God. I'm going to answer a question here, which I used to get asked a lot. Can you, can you lose your spiritual gift? And that's the next one along. But before that, if you put the next slide up, Johnny. Spiritual gifts can weaken or they can grow stronger. All right? The variation in strength. Is, so we, what we're not doing, we're not just kind of, um, what's the word? We're not, um, you know, them spiritualists who do the automatic writing. You know, have you heard of that? I'm, I'm receiving from the spirit here. Kind of we're not doing that, right? God is using us as people, his creation. We're made in the image of God. And the variation in strength of the gift is a combination of divine and human influence. Well, the problem is we mostly can't tell where one starts and the other ends. Depending what kind of, when Johnny does the theology of man, he might be a, what's called a dichotomist or a trichotomist. I'm a dichotomist. What that means is I think that we are a living soul made up of a body and a spirit. Those two things are tied together. And, you know, they're not some separate entity. And so it is with God. It's hard to tell where his part of the deal starts and where ours starts. Um, but the point is that he apportions it as he wills. And our influence on the strength of the gift that we have comes with things like experience. So I've been, been prophesying for 30 years. You should be better at it than somebody who's been doing it for a year maybe. Um, comes from training and wisdom. In, in any church, there'll be people who are very effective in using a particular gift. And you could think of some in this room. Some who are moderate and some who are just beginning. Now, I used to forget about that, and I still do sometimes. You forget that there are people who are just starting out, and you've got to make allowances for those people. Sometimes the gift can be less strongly developed in different people and in one person over a period of time, mostly through lack of use. If you're not using your spiritual gift, then it will weaken. Um, and... Paul reminded T Timothy to rekindle or not to neglect this, the spiritual gift that is within you, that he was given through the laying on of hands. Now, in most cases, talking about this idea of can you lose your spiritual gift, Christians permanently have the spiritual gift, but not always. All right? Now, there are occasions when um, it can be lost. I'll, I'll give you an example. So some gifts can be temporary by their nature, such as marriage and celibacy. Some of you don't want celibacy to be a permanent gift, right? Marriage, your husband or wife, God forbid, might die, so you, you're you not married anymore, so that gift goes. And some gifts cannot be exercised at will. No matter how hard you try, you can wear red shoes and click them together. You can't prophesy at will, unless... God speaks to you. You can't heal at will unless God does the healing. It can't be done. So in that sense, they're not permanent. You're not walking around permanently healing people. Everybody you touch turns to this magnificent healed person. That's not happening. It's also possible that through grieving the Holy Spirit, through neglect or serious doctrinal or moral error, that may cause the gift to be withdrawn. Now, sometimes folks might say, ah, yes, but Ed, 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 Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Okay. <laughs> That's not applicable in this case because that verse has to do with Israel's calling as God's people and has nothing to do with spiritual gifts. And so it's inappropriate for use in this context. We can't just cut and paste scripture and make it fit what we want it to fit. So... The next slide, I think I might have just jumped through a few. If you can find out what your gift is, you can find out much of your God-given purpose in life. As it's expressed in the activities of the kingdom of God and knowing what the church needs and what the gifts are can be out and that's what we're going to start to look at now. Now, in a minute, I'm going to say some fancy words and you think, what on earth has this got to do with spiritual gifts? But here's the thing. You mustn't think of the church as this little body of believers 
who meets on a Sunday in Sunderland. It's way, way bigger than that. Does anybody know how many Christians there are in the world? Yeah. No, no do I. I was just wondering. I was hoping one of you would know. Shucks. Never mind. Does anybody know the percentage of Pentecostal Christians and Christians in the world? Six hundred million. Yeah, which is about 25%. So multiply 600 million by four, you've got 2.4 billion. That's how many Christians there are in the world. Okay? Um, that's a lot of Christians. And there's more Christians than anybody else. Not that that means anything. Um, so, next slide, please, John. We're going to start to look at helps and guides. So, when somebody asks you, where are you going on a Sunday morning? You say, I'm going to a worldwide social, political, and theological entity that <laughs> has branches in every major city. <laughs> and when people ask Johnny, Johnny, where do you work? Johnny says, well, actually, I work for a branch of a worldwide social, political, and theological entity. <laughs> it's the largest entity of its kind in the whole wide world. It does all kinds of things. It heals the sick. It looks after the poor. It brings goodness to people's lives. We do all kinds of service in the community and generally make lives better. Want to know what it's called? It's called the local church. What this means is it's a, a combination of social which means relating to society or its organisation, political, relating to the government or public affairs of a country. Now, if you think the church isn't socio-political, then you just got to think, of, does the church do anything about alcoholism? Yeah. Yes. Does the church have anything to say about abortion? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's social and political straight there, just those two things. Also, it's theological, well, duh, um, relating to the study of the nature of God and religious belief, that's what theological means. So if we have the next slide, please, Johnny. We influence, we, the people in this room, we influence through the use of our gifts, ideological, conceptual, ethical, moral, philosophical, political, religious and spiritual matters in the UK. That's what we do. We don't just speak in tongues in the prayer meeting. And this is what Paul's getting at. He really is getting at this. He really is getting at this. He's saying, you guys are elevating people who speak in tongues. And that's, I speak in tongues more, more than all of you. But this woman who's, or this guy who's cleaning the floor is the one who's getting the job done. Okay? So, both gifts that we're going to look at now concern practical administrative tasks without which the church couldn't function in the world. Just before I watched Alison... I said that's an example of the gift of helps. She's in the kitchen helping, doing stuff, wiping the stuff that had fallen on the floor and that kind of thing. So it helps, this gift of helps, you'll find it in Corinthians, it has a broad meaning. So it means all kinds of helpful deed, deeds, all kinds of administrative support, helping the weak, being a helper of support, being a protector, a patron or patroness. Right? As long as you don't, so if you decide to support somebody financially, for example, you become their patron, yeah? The problem is, by being that, and I've seen that this done before, you think you've got some say in what they do. Now, I've had people in the past give me money, and um, they've done that, and they've never asked for any influence and that kind of thing. But I've seen it where people have done that, and they want influence over what the person's doing, okay? You see it all the time <coughs> with lobbyists in Parliament. Or in the states over politicians it's that kind of idea don't be like that if you're being a, a parent doing the books is a gift of help so you might think it's a gift of administration I'm gonna give you a shot in a minute about that if you have yeah, well Johnny's not gonna get a shot but you might not have heard this before but it's a gift gift of helps it's a broad gift now I left out of this doing a coffee doing the toilets and all the rest of it because I wanted to put that under serving later on. There's no, you've got to be careful about the demarcation between these gifts and making them too fine a line. You know, that's that one and that's that one. What he's saying is these guys who are helping, who are underpinning what the church is doing are really, really important. Okay. Now, um, I'll put an example up. So if I could have the next slide. Yeah. In, in Acts 6, 2 to 7, what they do is... They, they're having problems that the apostles are waiting on tables. So they get seven brothers, lay hands on them. They've got to be people filled with the Holy Spirit. They get them to wait on the tables instead. 
So they look after the widows so they can give their attention to prayer and ministry of the word. Now that's an example of the gift of helps. You might, you might start to say to me, oh, well, yeah, but Ed, the word for that is diaconos. I'm just saying that so you know that I know. Okay, I know it's serving, but we're all serving at one level or another. I mean, if, if the leader of the church isn't serving, then what are they doing? We're all serving. So I'm not going to read through that, but I just want you to know that in Acts 6, 2 to 7, it, it's there, there it is right there. Now, God's gift provides the wisdom, ability, and power to give whatever assistance is needed to whomever needs it. This gift of helps provides the wisdom, ability, and power to give whatever assistance is needed to whomever needs it now. The gift of guidance, next slide please, Johnny. And again. Right, this is formally administration. Now the problem with this is the word is cubinesis in the Greek, and what happens is, for years and years and years they've had this debate, and I was talking about this 20 years ago, where the word administration kind of does and doesn't cut it. In English administration, you think of the secretary. That's the problem, right? It doesn't mean that at all. The nearest thing they've got in sort of Greek that they can find isn't in the Bible. It's from somewhere else. Um, it means a pilot of a ship. So if you go down one, a steersman, right? And it means acts of guidance. So in your, if you get a brand new NIV, UK, by which, just a side note, does everybody know why the NIV is the NIV? Why it's translated the way it is? It's translated for people whose um, second language is English. That's what the NIV is for, just if, if you didn't know. So the, um, they put the word guidance in there now, in the new version of it. But it's giving wise counsel to the community. It's the ability to formulate strategies is one of the best translations from one of the most recent commentators that I can find. It's a form of leadership, of government. It's given the structural support. It's like running a big event. Someone who can keep the ship afloat amid the rocks and shallows when there's factionalism in the church. And some of us have seen that and some haven't. So this is kind of a leadership role. This is a, a quite an important thing. And there are people around who can do this, who can guide the church through these difficult times. Um, direct matters in a way that keeps it all from falling apart. And it can bring practical insight, especially for the inner life of the community. So when we're all sat together, having our differences and talking about our stuff, there are people who can get us through that kind of thing. So I just wanted to touch on those two actual gifts tonight. We're going to be looking at a lot more of the actual gifts themselves now. Over to you. Do you want to ask some questions? Or? Yeah, um, I thought it might be worth, first of all, before we ask you some questions, um, to actually just in your groups, just have a five minute, uh, five minute just reflection, uh, just to kind of give you a bit of a, an intellectual break. Um, so hopefully that, that, that made sense, that was really good, Ed. Um, and so if you, if you can just go in your groups and there's no kind of nominated leader, or anything like that, you can first of all select um, who you want to lead the group. Take Ooh. 10 minutes, 15 yep. minutes deciding that, and then have 30 <laughs> seconds discuss it. But just uh, have a conversation, and here's something you can just discuss. Um, what stood out to you? What stood out to you? And let's do five minutes of what stood out to you, and let's share around our groups, and then uh, we'll then come back up and do some questions and answers. Is that all right? Ooh. Cool? All right, five minutes. All right, anybody. Love to hear the love to hear the conversation. It's always good to rather than silence. And so um, I think you've had a good a good time to reflect and talk about what's stood out. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be uh, we're going to do a short kind of questions and answers. Um, so if you have any questions, um, if you haven't already thought about some questions think about them and we're not going to be able to have everybody ask a question particularly in this format but there is individual conversations that Ed is happy Ed said he's going to be here all night so he brought his sleeping bag so, so if you did want to have a conversation there's, there's time so you can follow, follow it up uh, if not tonight then you know uh, some other time so we're going to try to get, get, some, get to some questions a range of different questions and so if you think about what that could be and then we'll try to create some opportunity for that. Um, fantastic. So um, I'm going to ask Ed a couple 
of questions, and then we're going to see whether you guys have any questions. Um, if not, I'll ask a couple of you to ask a question. Uh, okay, so Ed mentioned about Ed, you mentioned about uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is the topic. But then, in Ephesians four, it talks about um, offices of Christ: leadership, giftings, the fivefold ministry, the prophet, evangelist, the teacher, the pastor. What else? Apostle. The apostle. So tell us the difference, the distinction between the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we all have, and then the five the difference between that and then the fivefold ministry gifts. Okay. So those people are specifically mentioned in Ephesians four, I think it's verse eleven, and I did have them up on the screen earlier, and it, it's quite confusing sometimes when people think, if I prophesy in a church, does that make me a prophet? Well, not really. Um, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't not make you a prophet, but, you know, anybody can prophesy, depending on God, at different times. What <coughs> generally makes you one of those things is you're recognized by the church, and you're set apart normally by the church leaders. I'm, I'm set up, Johnny, I'll just bri very briefly tell you what happened to me. I had had multiple tries of being a Christian. When I was about 30 odds, I... I fully committed, if you like, and then I had some kind of experience, and then the first church meeting I went to in the church, my wife had been going to for a long time, they'd been praying for me for years, and um, I went to the church and I had this picture, now I didn't know any of the language or anything like that, and I just went to front and I said, and I basically said, I've got a picture. And it was it was wasn't it was really good actually what it was. But we went pink tights as well. No, <laughs> no I've got a picture. And it, I said it's of a cool Scotland. The problem is that I'm pushing and it's disconnected from the engine, and I'm the only one pushing this cool Scotland. None of you are doing it, and God's saying you need to get pushing this cool Scotland. Well, the elder of the church, <coughs> he had led me to Christ. Actually, said, you know, I'm not really one for pictures. Um, and that was my first experience of being prophetic. But it just kept on happening. I was prophesying, all, I was saying all kinds of things, you know. And uh, uh, in, in the, the larger church that we belonged to as well, it used to meet on a Sunday night. And then eventually, and one woman rang up and said, Is the prophet there? And I, was like, oh. um, and I didn't know what that meant. I went, oh, Eventually what happened was... Um, the leaders of the church said, right, we're going to set this guy apart to be with this other guy who's prophetic and we're going to put them together and see what happens and see if he can influence him. And I was set apart then and I've been do doing it on and off for years and years and years now and I have specialities so I've prophesied about, it doesn't happen very often this, but I've prophesied about um, the fall of the Soviet Union before the Berlin Wall fell. Um, about um, profligacy and and, um, and stuff in the church in Nigeria. I can't remember exactly what I said about false prophets in Nigeria, which there are a lot, mm -hmm. and that God would show uh, this by there would be an unexpected flood in this particular place. And I was really scared about saying that because it wasn't anywhere near the sea or water, but a dam broke. Um, and I got a real shock, and actually I thought, boy, you've got to be really on this. So I had a few like that, but mostly it's like, you know, giving people insights into what's going on in their lives and, uh, and bringing wisdom and that kind of thing. But it is about being set apart. But yes, God can cause anybody to prophesy. Some people are, um, they are, and we don't like this terminology I'm going to use, but it's right there in the Bible. They are a gift of God to the church, right? And we hate to hear it if it's not us. But there's a respect in which we all gifts of God to the yeah. church. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand that. But there are some people who are set apart to prophesy. It's, it's mostly to do with use. And I think I'm always just maybe one page ahead in the manual than the next guy. I said that once and somebody said, no, you're up more than that. And I don't um, like that talk about myself, but I'm getting better at it. But So, I, I, you know, I've developed that prophetic ministry um, over the years and um, I could do, but it's mainly for God, my thing. I mean, he likes 
what I do and I'm trying to please him. So it's the same with um, evangelists and apostles and it's normally that they're set apart, they're recognized and set apart by other people. So if you prophesy loads and, and you know, maybe that will happen. Don't strive for that though, okay, because that's a bad thing to do and God, I'm not sure God likes that. Um, it was, it was an important thing I was going to say about it, but it'll come to me later. I'm sorry, I forgot what it is, but it's very important. Um, anyway, next question. I hope that's answered some of it anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to have a, a questionnaire that you'll go home with. There's 125 statements what? that you can <laughs> that you can kind of measure yourself against a little bit. They'll come out with you know, they'll come out with a range of different uh, gifts that are part of each person's gift mix. And a question I've got. Um, with that would be are there certain natural traits or natural temperaments um, or certain personality types that tend to be drawn to certain types of gifts for example I've noticed that prophecy type of people can be a bit strange <laughs> um, I'm not referring to you obviously but oh, uh, it's fine. Are you, is that a serious question? <laughs> okay um, yes there are. I um, was with a good friend of mine. You know, the guy I was telling you about who said, I'm not one for pictures. 40 years later, he contacted me. But I went, I'd fallen out with him because I did, he did something bad in the church and I, I caught him doing it. And it was just, oh, it wasn't sex or money or anything like Tell that. Tell us exactly so, what it was. <laughs> I've got my phone going on. I might tell you on another occasion. So, yeah. Um, what happened was, um, he rang me up and we got together for a coffee and as we were talking through it all, um, we were just chatting on and he said, I always did think you are a bit eccentric, Ed. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> Never heard that about myself, like, ever. Because I, in eccentric means to me, like, weird, wacky, egghead and all this. And I said to Cindy, my wife, I said, he says that I'm a bit... Uh, Weird. eccentric and, and this other guy I spoke to him about it I emailed him I said you see that oh, you're a bit weird like that's what Cindy said she said you're a bit weird like <laughs> I, oh <laughs> this is exact, her exact words were you are a bit weird like I always thought you'd turn out to be a bit like a naughty professor type <laughs> and I was like me <laughs> What are you talking about? So I went to talk to some other people and I took Cindy with me, some really good friends. I said, what's this business about me being a bit weird? What's that all? And they fell about laughing. And I said, yeah, you are. do you not recognise that in yourself? And I went, no, I'm, I'm surely not. I'm not weird at all. Apparently I'm really weird. So, so I say things and do things that other people don't consider to be normal. Let's put it that way. I do have an intellect. Um, I never realised for years and years and years I had to be told that as well, even though I'd won a scholarship at a fancy school when I was younger. Um, so it's things like that. So yeah, I, I, I think you should be careful though, because there's a lot of weird people about, especially in church, you know, you know you just don't know who's going to meet you in the corridor. But it's okay to be weird and I've come to the conclusion that I would say more creative. So that I look in this church, there's some create, really creative people. And uh, they tend to be prophetic as well. So that's part of it. And I think it's back to this, you're a body and soul. So how you, you hold, so you're a body and, and spirit. So how that all links together is important. What makes you up is important. That was the thing I was going to say. In terms of the prophet, you become the message. You become it. I've gone to places before and not had to say anything and all hell breaks loose. Or I've just said a couple of things and all hell breaks. Just by, I mean, all the church members are arguing with each other about something <coughs> minor thing. Um, so it, it's just something God does. It's just like something you're carrying and that you become. You become the message. It's a bit like Amos. Amos was a shepherd from Tekoa. You've got to be somebody from somewhere, you know. Hosea married a whore. You know, that kind of, that kind of deal. To show Israel what was going on. Ezekiel was lying on his side for a year and a bit, you know, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it become, you become part of that. So there is a difference. But we can all prophesy, we can all evangelize, we can all 
pastoring, I mean, group leaders are pastoring to a certain extent, aren't they? But there's a slight difference between that and the person who's been set aside um, and recognised to do that. Sorry, that was an earlier question. I realised I'm, I'm weird, so I can do anything now. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, in regards to the questionnaire, I did the questionnaire. And it is not, it doesn't take long to do funny enough. You've got to be dead honest with yourself. Don't fool yourself. Because God's watching. He's not going to be fooled. <laughs> and the thing is, it's really good. It's not the be all and end all, but I was shocked. I was really shocked at how, how it came out with the things that I know after 40 odd years. I know those things about me. So my top three things are exactly what I would expect them to be. And from that perspective, I would say it's pretty good. I did see this thing in different guys about 20 odd years ago. So it's worth doing and we'd like to bring it back next week if that's not too weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, help us to draw the line a little bit between natural gifting and spiritual gifts. The line's blurry, maybe, but maybe speak into that a little bit. The difference between someone just functioning naturally in their yeah. natural ability and then functioning spiritually in spiritual gifts. Well, the definition I gave you of a spiritual gift. Almost had an island partridge over there. Aha. The, the, is any ability. Listen. Any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in the ministry of the church. Now, I can make coffee. But it doesn't mean that I have a spiritual gift of making coffee. And it's something we're going to have to get our heads around. And really, Paul has been really clear about this. Is These gifts, these, if you like, natural gifts and quotes, are empowered by God. And they have a different meaning. I, you're a preacher, Johnny. You preach in front of the church. You know when it's, when it's so, kind of like you're the one. You've done your best. But, it's, and when, but when... God takes a hold of it. You can say virtually anything and God's got a hold of it and it's amazing what happens. I've prayed before when I've felt like I've been, when it's a real struggle and other times I've felt like I've been floating off in uh, heavenly places and meeting Jesus himself. Um, you know the difference. Now, the, what Paul is trying to do is bring in what the Corinthians are saying is, is the lesser things. Don't look down on them people who are cleaning the toilet stairs. Because there, the, there was a problem in Corinth where you had the elite who were all meeting and reclining on chairs and stuff like this and having their dinner. And then the workers would come in from the field. The workers, not the shirkers, they would come in. There was no food left. That's how you get the whole the 1 Corinthians thing about the whole um, the Lord's Supper and all that stuff. So... The, what Paul is saying is there is no distinction. But what we tend to do naturally is say that the guy who is prophesying has a greater gift. And the, the Bible does say, seek the greater gifts. And it is a greater gift. But his, his apportioning of the spirit is no greater than the others. And the gift is no less important. You've got to see the church as a unit. And we'll do this next week. It's a, a body is a unit. It's made of many parts, so there are diversities of gifts, lots and lots of different things. Your body has different functions, and there are, but there is a unity in the body. And if we can get each gift working, right? So today I could have done with somebody who knew about a connection to that monitor, because I just discovered it. Have I swan my my computer didn't have the right connector and stuff. Um, and now I'm technical, so I could have done with somebody like that. If we had all the gifts working all the time, it would be really good. But the, 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 Paul's not making a distinction, and that's that's a kind of a problem for us in 21st century church, because we do make a distinction. But we should honour the people who are cleaning the floors, doing the coffee and whatever, as much as the people who are who are doing the preaching and teaching and all of the rest of it. Um, being, being the talky person is a gift. It's not a, you know, it's, it, you do have some natural ability. That's what I'm saying. We all have some natural ability. All of us. I used to do sales conferences at one time and stuff like that. So I could get up and speak in front of a bunch of people. Um, you know, I've got an intellect so I can understand things and go, wow, they want to know about this. They want to know. That, that this is the, the nitty gritty of what it's actually saying. 
Um, so there are some natural things in you, but God is taking you and using what you have and empowering it for the good of the, the church's mission into the world, if that helps. I mean, it, it's a tricky one, but there, is, there isn't much difference. Let's put it that way. We've got to not have an attitude that it's massively different. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is always a little bit risky. Uh, <laughs> but does anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay. um, you mentioned that Romans 12, um, four, you said, according to the grace given to each of us, mm -hmm. you don't mind again, according to the grace, is that right? According yeah. to the grace given to each of us. Mm -hmm. And I've just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that, about, because it sounds almost like some of us have more grace given than others. Yeah, it means the opposite of that. It means according to the grace given to us. This is the, the remember the thing I said at the beginning. If you get one thing today, and you'll think you've got it, but you won't have it. Is that we all get the spirit equally. We get the spirit equally. It's, so the, it's the grace given to all of us. It's the grace given to us, yeah, and, and God apportions it as He wills, right? Apportions it in order for the function to be the function, not as, as to, I mean, you know, even like the people saying they've got more grace than me, but they don't. No. This is the thing, they don't have more. It's just different. The thing of it like this, off the top of my head, they think of God's grace and God's spirit like a diamond with different facets, right? And when you turn it and light it sparkles differently, we're all the facets, if you like, of that. So the, the, there's the grace, but we're just different facets of that same grace, if I can put it like that. And so I, I don't think that's a very good answer, but I'll think about it as well. I think I'd, I think I'd correctly. And okay, yeah. yeah. Now, I'm definitely saying that it's equal, um, but we have to accept that there are different people who will have what looked like the better job. You know, we all think we want to be the next Billy Graham. Well, a lot of us do. <laughs> and then when you realise later in life, you're not going to be that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I think we, we, see the, we see the shiny side of the gift that we want. Mm -hmm. And often we look at someone else's gift and we want that. But what we don't see is the pain of, of the purple yeah, other side. Yeah. So you can say a platform, you don't see the pain of the responsibility. Yeah behind that or the person who is enthusiastically you know serving cleaning the carpet you've mentioned that metaphor Meta that's a metaphor isn't it it's not just about cleaning carpets <coughs> but doing those types of things someone can enthusiastically do that but there's a, there's, a, there's a challenge to that as well sometimes you're the only one doing that type of thing and you're looking around thinking no one else is doing this yeah and so there's this pain yeah um, or a shadow to each yeah. To each gift. I, yeah, I used to say this. In, in, there were certain conferences I would go to, and they were, all the church the church planters and the church leaders would get up, and they, everything was squeaky clean. And it were like the Von Trapp family singers coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it lovely and wonderful and everything? Like this? And it's not. It's painful. It's really, really painful. I mean, you know, there's, there's prophets in the Bible who sat under a train going, Kill me now. Yeah. That's how bad it is. Now, I've nearly been, I might not have even been there. You know. I don't want this. Don't. I had an experience. <coughs> don't. I said to God, I was in a, in a bad mood. I was fed up. I was away from my family in London. And I said, don't speak to me. I'm not <coughs> having that. I was up in a loft room. You know, I wasn't grateful for anything. I had a smashing job, but I was away from my family. I said, don't speak to me. Don't even think about it. I'm not being prophetic today. Don't speak to me. I'm talking about this Blair government. It's coming in. What are you talking about, the Blair government? It's coming next year. Uh, I went, oh, oh, okay. What, what's this all about? So all of a sudden I started to listen, but I was still annoyed with God. So, you know, it can be painful, you know. And it can be painful when you're telling people a thing um, that they don't want to hear. Mostly that's what a lot of prophecy is that. You've got to be so careful with this. So I'll do it in a prophecy week, which there will be one. But you've got to be so careful about the grace of God coming through you, not judging the sides. God's not out to hurt people, but there is the thing of grace and truth, and you need to get grace first, then truth, not the other way around, or you'll just be throwing rocks at people. Yeah, good. And I think there's a danger in spiritual gifts 
that they can become narcissistic. They can become Definitely. about me, you know, I've got this gift, I've got this gift. And it can become very much about me. But as you say, Ed, in your, in your uh, uh, message part, is it's all about, it's a servant. Every, every mm -hmm. spiritual gift is a servant gift. Yeah. It's to build up the body. Yes. And we look at particularly in the prophecy week, how, how you're serving people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great question, uh, Gil. Any other, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you talk about how um, the gifts are given to us equally, but just out of curiosity, can an individual receive uh, different spiritual gifts? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The answer, <coughs> uh, it's a really simple answer. The answer is yes. You you may have a few spiritual gifts, um, and uh, that's important to know. And that questionnaire will actually help you. To begin to work out what that is or you, you may be somebody who you have a main gift and then some other gifts where you're not as good as that guy over there but you're you're you still have that gift mostly through wisdom experience and knowledge and that kind of thing as you grow in your gift um so yes and i would fully expect that with with some people that that to be more than one one gift i have more than one gift you know um, but, you know, I, there's some gifts I would love to have, but I haven't got. Definitely not. Um, but the, the short answer is yes, you can have more than one gift. And it's, it's the, the Holy Spirit is apportioned equally in God. God apportions the gifts as he wants them, which might mean you have several. Okay. Can you follow a spiritual gift that's not the right spiritual gift, but you think it is? You mean, can you be wrong about what your spiritual gift is? Uh, yeah, I would say so, just based on the experience I have. I'll give an example. As a girl in the church I was at, she thought she was highly prophetic. Now, a lot of people fall into this trap, and it might be that I'm a bit, I don't know if it's down to me, but she would, she would come and she would say, I saw the kids this morning playing on a trampoline. I got a picture of the I saw the kids playing on a trampoline. And what that is, is God wants us to um, bounce about and be like children and all the rest of it. And then she'd say she was very prophetic. Um, that's not a spiritual gift. That's her thinking about the kids, bounce about on a trampoline and using that as an analogy. And it's a good analogy of what God wants us to be like. Now, a lot of people do that with, and call it prophecy. So there's lots of conversations with it. And it's a hard one to swallow when you realize it's you doing that. Um, that what you do is you see something, and it can be prophetic, it can be God shows you something, I've had that happen to me, but you know, if they're doing it on a regular basis and bigging themselves up, say as a prophet, then you know, it's probably not that. Another one was a woman who would pray, she would she would say she was really prophetic, we'd have prayer meetings, she wasn't from our church, and she'd come in and I would say what we were praying for. So I'd say, right, we're going to pray for evangelism and church growth tonight. This is what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. Let's pray for those things that we are doing. We need to have an increase and a speeding up and that kind of thing. Then her prophecy would come. I see where God says you've got to put your foot on the accelerator and have an increase in speeding up and this kind of thing. Okay, it's not prophetic. It's just her repeating what the leader said from the front, you know. And thinking she could get away with it, and you know, you can get if you're a leader, you get cynical <coughs> about that kind of stuff, but yeah, you can. But that's what we're trying to help you with here is to see what you actually do. Seriously, this question is like I keep saying, caveat, it's not the be all and end all, but it'll get you started. Great, uh, one more question. Do you have any? This is a bit of a weird question. Can non-Christians have a spiritual gift? Yes and no. I'll give you an example. All right. So it's an old Just example. You see people that you know you think. Well, you know Bede. Yeah. The, the venerable Bede. He writes in his book about a guy called I think it was called Ethelfrith. He was a king, and he made a prophecy about some monks that they would all die. Blah blah. blah. So I can't remember the exact thing. It's pretty serious business. He was a pagan, and he gave this prophecy, and then of course, they did, they all got killed by some dude, well, Bede loved that, because he didn't like this particular band of monks, <laughs> so he attributed the gift of prophecy to this guy, so, um, 
But again, I think you have to be careful about it because um, prophecy is about glorifying God, maybe. <coughs> so it's kind of difficult, but it can happen. Blom's donkey prophesy. I always say that. So you don't have to be. I don't think Blom's donkey was a Christian. You know? But it, as a general rule of thumb, I'd go with Christian, yeah. You know, I mean, lots of people prophesy wrong. Um, Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism. Um, Muhammad, that dude, he got it wrong. Um, uh, who's the other one? James Russell, the JW guy. They were all looking for there to be a, a better kind of church, you know. And they miraculously all had visitations from angels and whatnot. And some of them had a bump on the head before. Seriously, the, Joseph Smith had a bump on the head before he got the golden tablets from womanism and all this kind of stuff. So um, we'll have to be very careful about it. But yeah. And there's also there's also uh, something else as well. There's uh, new age spirituality, yeah, which is basically unbiblical counterfeits yeah. of legitimate or is in the, in the scriptures legitimate spirit, uh, spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. uh, there's counterfeits, which that's a kind of worms. That's a massive kind of worms. Definitely. Uh, we could do probably something separate entirely on on uh, new yeah. age spirituality, but it's it, it is a, important to have discernment. And we baptize, we baptize our understanding of spiritual gifts, meaning that we bring it under the instruction of Scripture, because there are counterfeits that yeah. can, can actually talk about uh, a different spirit. There are different yeah. spirits that can mislead, misguide, yeah. uh, manipulate. Yeah, uh, is that kind of way? It, it says um, it says in Thessalonians that the despise. It says, "Do not despise prophesying," which means that they did, right? It said. Test everything. Yeah. Hold on to that which is good and get rid of the evil yeah. stuff. So you've got to do that. I wrote a whole paper on testing prophecy because nobody does it. In a lot of churches, the person goes to the front and says a bunch of words. You go, ah, oh, it's amazing that to give the prophecy. And I'm sitting with my cynic or 40 year hat on going, no, no, I'm not too sure. But um, we've got to be careful about that stuff. It's not all prophecy because somebody says it. And, you know, prophecy can be part of worship as well. It's different kinds. But you have to test it, and that's a job, yeah. you know, that we don't like to do. Yeah. Yeah. If we're caught up in the moment, you know, we don't like to test it and see if it's... One of the easiest ways to test prophecy, is if it's a prophecy about something that's going to happen, that's easy. That's the easiest. Because did it happen? Is, you know, yes or no? Yeah. Uh, tell us what's coming up next couple of weeks. So, next week we're gonna, I'm going to give you some surprises about what you would... Call a message of knowledge and um, wisdom and uh, revelation and some other kind of stuff around there. And you're going to learn a bit about, a bit more about, I'm going to give you a great quote from someone we were talking earlier about um, helping you to understand about the inferiority thing. Then, unfortunately I forgot what the phrase is, uh, miracles and whatnot, faith and uh, healings, right? So maybe if you're going to get ill, it would be a good night, good week to come. Um, and then in the last week, we're going to deal with the prophecy and speaking in tongues, okay? And, and discernment of spirits and those kinds of things. And next week, I'll still be doing a little background thing from Corinthians, but the week three and four, there'll not be none of that. It'll just be gifts only. And I kept the prophecy for the end because it's like what I know most about. You know, you'll get, you might get some surprises in the tongues thing, you tr um, and you might get some surprises in the two. You might even get a surprise when I talk about miracles as well. But you might get a surprise every week. I hope you do. I hope you get something out of it. That you've got. I've not, I've not realised that before about what it is. Um, so yeah, that's what's coming up. And Ed's guarantee is by the end of the course. Everyone will be able to levitate in the air. <laughs> <laughs>